All right. <clears throat> Okay, did anyone have any questions about when I graded your test, how you're, what you made on your test? I know Zach, Zachary came and talked to me, Zach did, but, um, yes? Uh, I wasn't here last week. Is there a time that I can make up the test? No, didn't you hear at the beginning of the semester, I said test one through four, you can't make up. There was a couple other people that didn't take it either, and I, you have to take the final. It'll replace the zero. Oh, okay. So if you miss another test, then you'll have a zero. <laughs> so that's what happened. Yeah, I can't schedule all those makeup tests. So let's see. And it says that in the syllabus too. So there's, uh, let's see here. Okay, so what I did, um, what you're going to see is that I did go in and put the dates in that weren't in here. Let me put this in student view. So you can see exactly in module two, which the way I'm setting this up, I know there were some modules showing up down here. No, they're gone. Okay. So module one is the one that we just finished with test one. And so we will have four modules that will revolve around each one of the tests. So when we finish uh, module two, there's gonna be a couple other things in here that's not in here yet. Um, then we'll be ready for test two. So that'll be at midterm. So the next test will be, um, let's see, fall break. I think I'd give it the Wednesday before fall break. Okay, that's when the, the second test will be. And so if you're not here in class, then you won't be able to take it. So. All right, so module two, what everyone should have already done, and I think it was an online student, not someone in here that um, had trouble with this more on variables, knowing what to take. And I had a student last class show me, let me get out of student view here, uh, that they were asking which exercises to do, but this was actually already due. So this link took you to W3Schools. You weren't supposed to click on that link you were just supposed to follow this guy in the video like we did on the first one. And these were the two exercises that you were supposed to do, those two tutorials, and then put them in a PDF. So I don't know if anyone had trouble, but you still can submit it, it's just gonna be late. So, and, and you need to submit it because he talks more, explains more about constants and things in here. That's why I had you do it really before a test. Okay, so in uh, module two, the things that we're going to do today, this was just an answer I loaded up there for 8B. If you didn't finish it, um, you can still submit it, but that's a Python answer for it if you didn't submit the Python. That's one way to do it. Then the unit three test, that's the thing that I'm going to go over a little bit today is unit three. And that test, I went ahead and delayed it, the, the due date to uh, next Monday night, but we're going to cover a lot of unit three today. And that's, we're going to go over these two MindCap programs. Has anyone done these yet? Anyone in here? Okay, we're going to complete these so that you won't have that problem. But then this one, uh, I won't, I'm going to introduce it in class and the PDF that you'll use for it so that everybody can find it. And then uh, this is not due till the next week, we're gonna talk about more about functions. We've done a little bit about functions, but not, uh, not what I wanna do before I, uh, this, he gives you an introduction to fun functions. Oh, too bad you didn't tell me to show. Uh, So you haven't seen anything I was showing you here. Let me, let me go back to student view for a second then. Okay, so what I was showing you is module one that we just completed because we took test one. Here's module two. And this is where the link to uh, the answer to a py the Python for that particular problem. If you didn't understand it, we can go over it if you want to. 
Um, then there's where I was showing you about the more on, on variables. Um, this little link, somebody was clicking that and you don't want to click that. It takes you out to W3 schools, I think. So you, this is the link that you click on to get his video and then you do these two tutorials and PDF the ants. Be sure you include where you've done the problem and the solution in PyCharm so that I don't just see the problem. And that's what somebody did on the test, I think. So also there was some problems in PyCharm. Some people didn't know how to save um, their actual code that was in PyCharm and so they did PDFs or whatever. So in PyCharm, on these computers, it's an older version of PyCharm because I tried to create um, the Windows one on my PC downstairs and I downloaded the current version. So it's a little different, but you, if you open PyCharm right now, I can show you if, you if there's any questions. If you had problems knowing how to submit your Python file because you couldn't find it, there's a couple of different ways. You can do this up here and say file, save as, and then you can find the actual location that you want to save it so that you'll know how to go and find it to upload it into Canvas. The other thing is you can right click on the name of the program and even in Windows, it'll give you this drop down. And on these PCs, does anyone have PyCharm open right now? Okay. On, on this version, uh, okay, yeah, right click, and it's called File Path, this one there. And that shows you if, you, if you click on it, it'll show you where it is in Explorer, and then you can just open it up, okay? So that version is a little different. Let me know. Yeah, on, on, it's the same thing as this that says, um, copy path, and then I can go out in on my Mac and go to Finder and put the path there, and it actually will find. Actually, I didn't even have to put the path payroll. There it is, and so then I have it to upload into Canvas. Did you find it? Uh, did you get yours uploaded? The okay. test when you took the test. Uh, test two. Test one. Uh, no, the one we did in class last oh, Wednesday. No, I don't. I was not here last Wednesday. Oh, you wasn't? Yeah. You missed it. Too. Yeah. Ethan, did you see what I was saying? Because you should be able to see it. Oh, you saw the. Finding it where it had uploaded. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm coming with my show. I'll talk to you after class. Okay. Um, so. All right, so um, that, that was what I wanted to go over in PyCharm. And I also told students if you wanted to do it in Idle instead of PyCharm, if, that, if you understand that better, you can do Idle. That's what I've used in the past. Okay, so um, let, me, let me take that little, I want to take that little icon out of there. I don't, well, I don't know how that's doing that because it's not even in here. Maybe it's this, I don't know. Huh, yeah, I don't know why it's given that little icon that's confusing students. Okay, so what we're in module two, uh, we're gonna go in and look at unit three and then we're gonna do these two MindTap programs and then I'm going to assign that one and that's what we'll all be do by next Monday. So let's go to, I did have some page open. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so first thing we're going to look at this chapter three. And in this chapter, oh, that's because I signed out. It's signed back in. This chapter is about the three structural. Uh, concepts that I told you that we would be using all semester and if you learn how to use a combination of those three structures you can code any program so um, that's and it's called understanding structure and in chapter two there was a little bit about modular programming and and that was structured code 
but this goes into more detail. Have, has anyone read the chapter yet? You know, understanding structure? You have Ryan? Okay. So this is going to go into detail. Like what chapter two did was like an overview. And if you remember, I talked about the word modular or modules that they use in our textbook in our Cengage book is the same as a function in Python. So that's why we're doing that where that guy shows you how to use functions in Python. In other languages, it might be called a subroutine. It might be called a method. But it, that's why module is the generic term. That is what every language, if you're doing pseudocode or you're doing flow charting, then it's called a module. And then it will work with any language. OK, wait, I got to the wrong. Okay, so this chapter, um, and I've talked about it either in the videos or in class about spaghetti code. And when I first co started coding in the um, early 80s, 79, 80s, spaghetti code was very common. It was go-to programs. It was unstructured. And so this portion of the chapter tells you what it's like to have unstructured code. It's very confusing because you see how these lines you can go all different directions before you get to the stop. And so it's very hard to follow this type of code. And here are some of the disadvantages. And so when you take the unit three test, those are some of the things that it'll, the, the terminology is what it tests you on. Now, this is what this chapter is really about. But, and the rest of the semester is about using these three basic structures. And what we have done like on test one and in module one, all we did was sequential structure. We started at the top, we defined our variables, we did, or we got the input from our variables, then we did a process step and an output, and then we stopped. So that you started at the top, you executed each step, and then you stopped. That's called sequential. Today, we're going to look at selection and loop. Selection, we've talked about it. it. It can also be called decision structure. It can be called branching sometimes. And sometimes loops are called repetition. So those are all, those are synonymous terms with those three structures. So with these three structures alone, you can diagram any task from doubling a number to performing brain surgery. You can diagram each structure with a specific configuration of flowchart symbols. So we're gonna learn a new flowchart symbol, the diamond shape in this chapter. We haven't, we haven't used it except for in chapter two, you did see it in the modular section, but we didn't really do any problems with modules yet. So sequence structure, this is a picture of it with flow charting symbols. You start at the top and you go down until you get to the stop. That's sequential. And you may think that you have to do sequential structure with numbers, but it's not always numbers. Like when you give somebody directions to say, this was your house address, 634 Washington. Will you give them, or if you look on your navigation, the list of instructions to get somewhere? That is a logical sequence of steps because you can't do them out of order or you wouldn't get there, right? So it's, it's by sequence. These would be in the boxes up there. Go north on First Avenue for three miles. Turn left on Washington Boulevard. Go west on Washington for two miles and stop at 634 Washington. So that's a straight sequential steps to get somewhere. Now, what if there was branching? A, it's sometimes called a decision structure. It's also can be a Boolean expression. And I talked about this, I'm not sure if I did in this class, but there was a mathematician named George Boole. He's the one that came up with a Boolean expression. And the difference in a Boolean expression and other comparisons is that there's only two possible outcomes. Something's either true or false, yes or no, 
one or zero. If you if you're in engineering, you have circuits and they have switches on them, and they're either off or on, and that determines the result of all those switches in that circuit. That's going to give a certain result. But here we're only going to be concerned with if we're comparing something, it can only go to the right or to the left. It can only be answered with yes or no or true or false. And so when you do a selection structure, you have some kind of condition in here. And if the answer is yes, you're gonna branch here and do what's in this one. If the answer is no, you're gonna branch here, do what's on this branch, but both of them are gonna meet and end at the same spot. That's why it's called structure. So here's an example in code. Sometimes those are called if then else structures. Here it is in pseudocode. If some condition is true, then do one process. Else, do the other process and then end the if. So those words that are in bold, those are part of every if then else statement. So here's those directions where you might have an option or you might have a condition that you have to meet. It says, if traffic is backed up, so they added that to the directions. If traffic is backed up on Washington Boulevard, then continue for one block on First Avenue and turn left on Adams Lane. Now, what happens if the tra traffic is not backed up? Then you'll turn left on Washington Boulevard. So you don't even do this step if this is false, I'm, I'm sorry, if this is, if, yeah, if this is false, then you're gonna drop immediately to this step and you're not even gonna do this one. So it meets this, it says, if some conditions, well, in this case, the condition is traffic is backed up. If that's true, then do this process, else do this process and then end it. And any branching uh, or selection structure, no matter how complicated it is, it should fit in this template, right? So here's a payroll program. So if you wanna see it more with um, actual uh, business problem, you could say, if hours worked is more than 40, so you've worked overtime, then calculate regular pay and overtime pay. Doesn't tell you how to calculate it, but it says this is what we're gonna do next. Else, if you don't have any uh, um, overtime, then you just calculate regular pay and end if. So this is called a dual alternative. Up here, what we've been doing, because what does the word dual mean? Two things. So you have two options. You can, in, I'm sorry, in this one up here, you have two options. If it's true, you do this. If it's false, you do this. But there could be times when there's a do nothing branch, a null branch, if you will. So it would say, if it is raining, then take an umbrella. Otherwise, don't do anything. If employee participates in the dental plan, then deduct $40. Otherwise, don't do anything. So those are called single alternative because there's only something that you do on the true side. So here's what the flow chart would look like. It still has the no branch, but it's null. There's nothing on it, right? So on the yes branch, we're gonna do something. On the no side, we're not. So then the loop structure. We're going to be in this chapter talking about while loops. There are other kind of loops. When we get to arrays, we're gonna talk about a for loop, but right now we're only going to use what's called a while loop. So there's actually three parts to a loop. And sometimes you'll hear the loop structure referred to as repetition or iteration, okay? So it just depends on what book you're looking at. But those three structures you can build any kind of program with a combination of those structures, and that's what we're gonna look at next. So here is what the flow chart for a loop structure. It still has a decision box, but you'll notice the no side is at the bottom of the diamond shape instead of to the left. Because when it's a loop, 
you're going to say, if this condition is true, then do the loop and then come back up and check the condition again. And if the condition is still true, do the loop again. And so I continue to do this until it's no longer true, then I drop out of the loop. So here's an example of pseudocode, which is closer to what the Python's gonna look like. So some people call it a while do loop because while this is true, do this. Okay, so they call it a while do loop. But the condition is tested at the top of the loop. And as long as it continues to be true, then I'm gonna do some process and then I'm gonna end. So here's an example of the directions. While the address of the house you are passing remains below 634, and isn't that what you're doing when you're looking for an address, when you're going down the block? You keep looking until you get to that address. So you travel forward to the next house, look at the address on that house, and you say, oh, is it 6, 634? No, so I'm gonna go to the next house. And I continue to do that until I come to 634, then I drop out. So things that we do every day are actual, actually logical steps. You just don't think of it because you're not having to tell a computer what you're doing. But see the computer, it can only do what you tell it to do as the programmer. So you have to tell it how many times to iterate through a loop. So why you could, here's, here's something that you do every day too, and we don't even think about it. While you, while you continue to be hungry, take another bite of food. Unless you're sitting in the classroom, right? And you don't get to eat when you're hungry. No. <laughs> but normally, you continue to be hungry, take another bite of food. Determine whether you still feel hungry. Still feel hungry? Then take another bite of food until you're no longer hungry. And then drop out of the loop. That's how simple a loop is. Yes? Why is there, uh, like, on the last reason, why is, like, there is no do percent? Oh, because it just left the do off. But you're, where are you saying? Right here? Yeah, the last one while uh, unread pages remain in the reading page. Read another unread page. Yeah. Determine. And that's, it's just like this one. But it, the do process, see, this is using the bold um, words there to show you mm -hmm. every do, every while loop is going to have a while section, a do section, and an in while. So here, this is the while section, this is the do section, and this is the end while. Okay, so while you continue, okay, so that was that one, now let's go to a regular one. Okay, um, this is really good to watch through if it just goes over again, what I just talked about, and she does it in two and a half minutes, I think. I played it in the morning class and I thought she was gonna explain something that she didn't. So I'm not gonna play it, but you can play it. Attaching structures together end to end is called stacking structures. So we have three structures, but we can stack them together in one program. And so the template for what that would look like, both in pseudocode and in flowchart, if you stacked a sequence on top of a selection, on top of a loop, they all connect together. And so that's what it would look like. And here's what it would look like in pseudocode. You would say, do step A, do step B. And then if condition C is true, do step D. If condition C is not true or false, you would do the else section, which is step E. So this is what kind of a selection? Dual or single? Dual. Dual. Here is the loop that says, if condition F is true, do step G. Continue to do it until this is no longer true and then drop out of the loop. Okay, then we have something called nesting structures. But remember, we're still only using those same three structures, but we're gonna combine them and we're gonna nest them means one is inside of another. So here it would say, if you're at condition H, we've nested a sequence here inside the loop, 
we're saying if the if condition H is true, do step J, step K, step L, and then X is the loop. If condition H is false, then you would go out. That's a branch, right? It's not a loop, it's a branch. So we have nested a sequential structure inside of a selection statement. And this is a single alternative, right? Okay, so here's one. What is nested? This is a branch, this is an if statement. See, it's a branch. But what's, what's nested inside of the sequential? A loop. So look, we have a sequential step and then inside of that sequence, we've nested a while loop. And then we have our last sequential step and then we go out. And it's still a single alternative selection statement, right? So it's still a combination, but it's a combination of done in a different way. So here's another one that's even nested more. Look at the pseudocode here. So what is this that's inside the, the yes um, uh, branch here? I'm sorry, what is this inside the loop? So th this is the while loop right here, you're correct. And what's this right here? Dual alternative selection, right? So it's if condition O is true. So this if else is nested inside the while loop, right? And then the while loop is nested inside the procedural, the sequence. So now this one is just an example of using that nested if. This is the chart or the reference that you want to always know where it is if you like flow charts. Because remember I said after test one, you can pick between pseudocode and flow charting. But this is a sequential with one entry point, one exit point. This is a selection. This is the dual alternative selection. This is a loop. So these are the templates for flow charting each one of those structures. Now, this is the important part of a loop, but I'm not gonna do the don't do it because I don't like those, those are kind of confusing. Okay, if I was doing that original program that I've always, that I've done since the beginning of asking for a number and doubling it, here's what my flow chart would look like if I'm using a loop. Because you remember when I originally wrote the program, it only runs one time with one number, right? Well, maybe I want to run it with a lot, of, a lot of numbers. So I want it to keep looping until I tell it to quit. Okay? So I have to have something called a priming input before I get into my loop. So I start here, here's my variables. These are the two variables that I'm gonna use in the program. And then I, this is called a priming input. And most of you guys won't remember this, but used to you had to prime an engine of a car by hitting the foot feet a bunch of times to get the gas flowing in the engine. And that was called priming. Well, that's what we do here. We've got to put something in here before we can test it. So if we don't ask for input first, then we don't have any way to know if we're ready to stop. And that's what EOF means in the file, but we're not gonna actually use an EOF. That's kind of old code for procedural language. We're gonna say, if you don't have a number, if you haven't input anything, then you're gonna be ready to stop. So here it's gonna say, put say, let's say for instance, we put a five in there, okay? We're gonna come down here. Is there something in original number? If we put five in there, is there something in it? Yes. So we're gonna go down here and we're gonna calculate our answer and we're gonna print out our answer. If there was five in there, 
to print out a 10, right? Then it says, input another number. So what I'm gonna ask the user to do is I'm gonna say, enter, enter another number or quit, or EOF, okay? And so say they enter an A. Then I'm gonna go back up here again. I'll say, is there, is there a number in there? Yes. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna say, calculate it, it'll be 16. Print it out. Do you wanna keep going? Do you wanna enter another number? Let's say EOF, no I don't, end of file. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna say, do I have any more number? No, then I saw. It. So basically if we want like certain amounts, so like let's say 25, we want not, I mean, we want the answer and stuff, not EOF, we should, we want 25. And, and we start with number five, multiply by two, you know, stuff like that. Yes, let's go in here, let's, let's do this. I'll either open PyCharm or Idle, whichever you're most comfortable with. And I'm gonna change this to, let me make a new one, new project. This one is gonna be called number doubling, I'm gonna call it. We're gonna actually, this why I think you have to have a program language of some kind. Uh, how would you like to open a project? Okay, I gotta open it as one. Uh, new Python file. Name num double. Okay, so if I'm gonna code this in Python and I look at my, <clears throat> if I look at my flow chart there, what it was saying, oops, that wasn't the right one. I wanna close this one out of the way. Oh, that's gonna mess that up. Okay, here it is. Okay, so the first thing this tells me to do is to declare my variables. I can do that if I want. I don't have to in Python, but most languages you do. Oh, where did my one go? Hold on. There it is. Okay, so I'm gonna say, um, I'm not gonna, de I, I can declare, uh, if I call it uh, a ridge num is equal to zero, I'm initializing it. Okay, that's what you have to do in a lot of languages. Then my other one's gonna be my answer. Those are just variable names I've come up with, right? And I'm gonna assume these are all gonna be integers, okay? So next I'm going to do my priming input. So I'm gonna put a comment, comment here so that I know what I'm doing. I'm gonna follow um, my flowchart or pseudocode. So I'm gonna do a priming input so that means I'm just gonna ask for original num is equal to, and I'm gonna make it an integer, input and another parentheses and a quote. I'm gonna say, please enter a number. Uh, I'm gonna make it easier to read, so I'll do that and in quote. Okay, so now it's gonna ask, that's my priming input, okay? So next, I entered my loop, didn't I? So I have to say while, and what am I testing? A number in there, so I'm gonna say while original num is, um, let's see, is, equal to or less equal to or greater than zero. Okay, would that work? Is that, a, is that a valid statement you think? If it's greater than or equal to, if it's equal to zero, I probably don't want it, right? So I probably want it to just say greater than zero. And then the way Python works, I have to put a colon there. Then I come down and what do I wanna do if it's greater than zero? Double it. So I'd say my answer 
is equal to original num times two, right? And then do I want to do anything else? What did my flow chart say I have to do? I have to print it and then I have to ask for input again, right? Okay, so get back to it, my pie charm. All right, so I want to print it out. So I'd say print, and I'm going to go ahead and tell what it is. Um, my number doubled. And then I can put this and let's see. I'm gonna have to put a comma and what's the name of the variable that I wanna print out? What's my output? Oh, my. my answer. So now this is something that people had trouble with test one too. Also is they took the test value and just put it in there. But our whole idea is this is a variable so we can change it each time we run it. So now we wanna do this same input statement again. So I'm kind of lazy. I'm just gonna copy and paste. Cause I have to ask for it again or else it will keep running with that same number, right? So this is called the, um, what do they call that over there? <laughs> this step gets the subsequent inputs, okay. All right, so do I need to do anything else? Yeah, see in Python, that's very good. In Python, it doesn't make you do any kind of in while. That's part of pseudocode, but you are ready to end. So it will just drop out. And just so I'll know that I'm at the end and I can say something like print end, oops, end of job then I'll know that I got down to the end, right? So you'll notice how that has to be in line with the while because I don't want it to print end of job every time it goes through the loop, right? Okay, and I could put comments out here. I could say like, this is my while loop condition or test, whichever you want to call it. This is my actual loop body. I remember the, the um, oops, the um, interpreter isn't gonna read my comments. That's just for me, okay? This is where I output results. And this is where I um, in, uh, request second input. Actually, it may not be second. I'll just say request input for loop. Okay, so you can comment every line of code so that you know what you're doing, okay? Sometimes up here we might put um, declarations. Okay, so anybody see something that won't run? You think it'll run? Anybody, did I make any mistakes? Okay, let's try it. So I'm gonna go up here to my run button or you can use your go one, right? Please enter a number. So I'm gonna enter a five, I'll make it easy. My number doubled is 10. And look, it asked me to enter a number again because I'm in a loop. This time I'm gonna enter the eight. It doubled it. Yes, right here you mean? Yeah. Yeah, mine was okay. doing that too and I just moved it forward. Okay. There's probably a way to get it not to do that, but I'm not sure. Okay, so here I actually should have said, please enter a number and here I should have said, please enter a number or zero to quit. So right here, if I enter a zero, it should automatically quit, right? Let's see if that works. And it did, end of job. 
but so that the user knows I wrote the program so I know what it's looking for to quit but because I really want this to be for others I would say or zero to quit okay so now when it runs it'll actually tell them what to do now um do you have any questions why we did it a certain way anybody what if we okay let's make sure that you understand that what would happen if this line wasn't here to enter again let's comment that whole line out now what does everybody think is going to happen before i run it what do you think i commented out so it's like that line it's not going to ask for input again if i know what's going to happen don't why do i then why do i need that line of code there this one that i commented out where i ask for input again oh if you get the second uh, what's going to happen okay let's it it actually it actually you're close if it stays in there what's going to make it end what is my condition that will make it end if i if i don't ask for input again and i only put the five in there what's going to happen when it comes back up here again still going to be five right Okay. Okay. very good just going to keep running the same thing so it's going to be what we call an infinite loop so if i go here and i say run i say it says please enter a number and i put five in there it's not ever going to stop it'll keep going on forever too much output to process see what it says in in pie charm so i have to go over here and tell it to clear Oops, no, I can't do that. How do I end it in PyCharm? I know how to end it in idle. Uh-oh. Let's see here. Nope, that didn't end it. Okay, let's let's put this back. And there was another thing I was gonna try. Let me see. Let me run it again, see if it got rid of it, I hope. Yeah, there it is. So here it's gonna do right and zero to quit so now if i say zero it will quit yes you need to have it sure. see and if i commented this one out what's going to happen everybody know what's going to happen if i don't have a priming input okay it's going to come in what is original number this first time in it won't even print it will it it'll print end a job because there's zero in there so when i enter it here see all it did was type end a job it never did ask or it never did print out the answer because the first thing it does when it starts executing this problem is it says while original num is greater than zero well i set it to zero up here so is it greater than zero no so it's not going to do any of this it's just going to come out of the loop and print in the job everybody follow any questions keep on which which part did you
That was a pie charm thing. That's why sometimes I use idle, but if you take script programming or anything, you gotta learn to use pie charm, so. Okay, so now let's go back. Let me go back and see if there's anything else that I need to cover in here. But if you get that simple steps down that you always have to have a priming, and sometimes you can use a counter if, it, if you're gonna go through the loop, like say, we're gonna do some problems here at the end where you go through a certain number of times. But um, now on your unit three test, I'm not gonna go over this because you can read it, but, um, and your test will, will cover this because those are, um, that's terminology that you need to know. Uh, okay, recognizing structure, and I don't like this portion of the chapter either because I think it's confusing um, because it has you go in and tell which is structure and which isn't structure. Well, I don't, I don't get into it that deep as far as the structure goes. So just so that if you can answer all the review questions, you should be able to do the unit test. So this is showing you here again, structured and unstructured logic. But something that you will see is this is the pseudocode for catching a dog, for instance. And the pseudocode and flowchart for this says it's just, it's just using those three structures, but a whole bunch of times. So it says, first thing you do is catch the dog. Does the dog run away? If it does, then you gotta catch the dog again. So you gotta loop. When you've caught the dog and it doesn't run away, then you turn on the water. Does the dog run away again? Yes, then turn off the water, catch the dog. Does the dog run away? Catch the dog, go up here. It's very confusing. You're going around and around and around. But what we'll learn to do is, do you see anything that is repeated over and over in here? Yeah, and so you can actually take that Hard and pull it out and create a little module. And then you only have to code it one time and then you just call it. And we, were, we talked about that a little bit. Um, maybe I didn't in this class, I can never remember. But uh, that's what they're doing here. See, catch the dog, start the water. So here they're making a call to that and here's the actual code to do that. So every time it sees catch the dog, start the water, it'll go down here and run this. Then it'll come back right beneath it and do that. So that's called structured. And that's, this is called a module or in Python, it's gonna be called a function. And in uh, the book, they use a uh, module shape that has a horizontal line across here. And in Lucidchart, we don't have that, we just have a rectangle with vertical lines on each end. And that is the same thing. Predefined process, they call it in Lucent chart. So there's another video for you. Okay, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna go ahead and do the mind tap problems so that you guys won't have trouble with that at home the way those are and you'll have part of your homework done, right? Okay, so we'll go to the code. And actually you can get into it from Canvas. If you, you can do it either way, it'll work either way. Then we click on using flowcharts and pseudocode in Python. So if you're not doing them with me, then you might have trouble at home, but you can do them at home, it's up to you. Okay, so, oh, this one's already done, so you can actually talk about it when I did them earlier in class. So what this, the only thing that yours doesn't have that mine has is these two input statements. And the whole purpose of this exercise 
is they want you to see this is the pseudocode for this problem. And what the problem is, is when completed, the college admissions officer should be able to use the Python program to determine whether to accept or reject a student based on his or her class rank. So it's going to ask a test score and a class rank. And if this is the if statements and the else statements, see this one is nested inside this one. Now, what I want to ask you is, look, in the pseudocode, it simply says input test score and class rank. So that's the part that's missing right here that you have to code. But what do you see that's different from this pseudocode that starts with the if, like for instance, this line of code? What's different, that's pseudocode. What's different in the Python? It's got the colon and there's no then, right? So this is generic logic to solve that problem. And this pseudocode will work whether you're doing Java, C++, C++, doesn't use a colon, it uses a semicolon. So that's why I'm saying different programming languages, the syntax is different, but if you can do the pseudocode, then you can solve the problem. It's just looking up the syntax for that particular language. So this pseudocode says if test score is greater than or equal to 90, then, so you don't even see this nested if, if it's not 90 that you're entering, right, for a test score. So up here, you can enter these inputs and then we'll test it. Because that's what it's gonna ask you to do, is put those two inputs in. So test score equals int, input, please enter a test score. So you can type those in. Brianna, can you see him back there? Ethan, can you see that? You probably can't, can you? Okay, so it says test score equals int input. So I'm doing the conversion to an integer in one statement. You can, um, some of the output shows, or some of the. Tell me when you're, if you're still working. And then, okay, once you get those two in, then what it tells you to do down here is to try it. See, I thought it would make you do this. Uh, the way they originally had it done is you made this into test score string, and then you had to convert it to test score. So they had it in four statements, but it gives you 100% without doing that. So if I did it the way exactly that it tells you to do it there, it would say test string. I wouldn't have this int on here. I'm just going to do this one this way and then the second one I won't. Then it would say test score equals int test score string. Oh, what I do? That did not do right. Mm -hmm. Ant test score. So this, these two statements together do the same thing as this one statement, right? So you could do it either way. See, they tell you to use test four strings because they want you to know when you ask for the input, it's going to come in as a string, which you can't do a comparison here on a string. If you don't change it to an integer, it can't do this comparison. So if I go down here now and I run it, it says, to run it the first time with 87 as the test score and 60 as the class rank. So if I do that, if I run it as 87, it's not going to do 
this part because it's not greater than or equal to 90. So it's going to drop here. If test score is greater than or equal to 80, then if class rank is greater than or equal to 50, which it is because it's going to be 60, then it should print accept and end, right? Let's see if it works. I'm going to go over here to my run button. Oh, maybe I'm in. Where is this? Okay, so I'm going to say run. It says, please enter a test score. It told me to use 87 first. And then it said to use rank 60, except. So that's right. Then it says to run it again and just flip those two numbers. So if I run it again, I say 60 for the test score and 87 for the rank, it got reject. Because there's no, if the test score isn't a 70 or above, it's just going to drop straight down to print reject. Right? Did, you, did you see it again, Brian? Can you see it? Do you need me to make it bigger? Let me see if I can. If you did it like the first way, then it would look like this, then there would only be two statements. And then you have to come over here and do your checks, right? Do run checks. And you should get 100%. Anybody need help? Everybody got it. You got it, Gregor? Okay, anybody need to wait? Everybody got it. Okay, so I'm gonna cancel this one. We're gonna go to the second one. Writing a modular program in Python. This one is a little more finicky before you get the 100%. So let me show you. Come on. We had a little bit more trouble with this one just because of spaces and things. <laughs> okay, so this one, what you're going to put, we're going to, if yours says this, we're going to um, take that out. But actually, you can just um, take these statements. We're going to ask for. This, this particular Python program is going to validate that you're inputting a valid date. So your it says if the date is valid, then the years are greater than zero. The months include the values 1 to 12, and the valid days are 1 to 31. So up here, what, are the, what kind of variables are these called? They are integers, but what? What do you see about these variable names? Constant. Very good. So these are the values that it gave you right here. So it said the minimum year has to be zero. If it's zero, it's not going to be a valid year. If it's one, the minimum month is one. The maximum month is 12. Minimum day is one. Maximum day is 31. And you're going to have like a switch variable that starts out set to true. So it's a Boolean variable, right? And if it starts out that the date entered is true, then if it's not, uh, doesn't follow these rules, then it's going to turn valid date to false. 
That's what our logic is going to do. Okay, so here's, um, let me take these out. Where, what it wanted you to do was put input, enter year. So here's what yours should look like if you take these out. I'm just taking these out because I did it at the bottom. So here it says, get the month, then the day, then the year. So here's the input statements to do that. So that's what you need to code. That's not in yours, right? Year equals input enter year. Month equals input enter month. Day equals input enter day. Now you notice those aren't converted to integer, right? Look where they converted it to integer. In the actual if statement. And look in Python, in, if you're gonna, if your else statement has a nested if, then you can use something called an ELIF. That's a Python thing, but you didn't have to code that, right? All you had to code was these three statements and the output down here at the bottom. You've got to code these two right here. That these say print. Let me see if I can get it to go over. I think it's here. Got. Uh, Maybe it's here. There we go. Okay, so you have to code these. And at the bottom where it says, if valid day, remember in Python, I told you a comparison, you have to use a double equals because an equal sign means a sign. So here it says, if valid date is true. So if up here, it didn't find any of these things false, then it says, if valid date is the same as true, then you're gonna print month plus a slash plus the day that you entered plus a slash plus the year plus is a valid day. And you have to have exactly the number of spaces that are in there that will give you an error. <laughs> yeah, there's a space here. The word is a space, a, only the things that are in quotes have to be exact or it will, won't give you 100%, even if you get the right output. So you have to create two output statements and you can actually, if you get this one, you can copy and paste it here and just change the word valid to invalid. That's all that's different. I'm gonna, there we go. Brianna, did you get the top part? There was the input. And then here's the two output statements. Yes, please. What's that? Oh, you need the top part? Okay. There you go should say year equals input, enter year. So you're only gonna have to add to this Python, the input and the output. And it tells you that in those instructions. I'm just helping you with this one. So it did all the other coding for you it did the um, actual if statements and nested ifs for you. There's no loops in here, just an if statement. Everybody ready for the bottom now? I'll go down to the output. All right, so once you get that in, then you can run it at, with the, um, go back here so I can see. Here's what it tells us to run it with. It says to use, what is that at? 
Uh, oh, I thought it told up there somewhere, 2015. Oh, I think I have to go here, don't I? So here it says run checks, and that's what's going to tell me. Okay, that worked. It says everything works, but I haven't actually run it. <laughs> it lets you get 100% without running it if your checks all come out. You have a period at the end of the Yeah, somebody else was having trouble with this. They lost class. Thank you. This is case complete and validate. Code pattern. That's where it messes up is the code pattern. Search your code for a specific pattern. You can learn more about regular expressions here. Year equals. Did you use single quotes up here or double? I mean, Try using single and see if that makes any difference. It shouldn't in regular Python. That's why you see this little download thing. Mm -hmm. You can download it and run it in idle or PyCharm. And then um, it
Yeah, uh, the reason I'm just saying is to say we are smart than they had to replace them before. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it, it should be like that, Zach. It should be if and else. You don't want to change those. And then you've got to make sure the word print is in line with that hashtag right below it. 